I'll be presenting a case study you know, with, you know, related to machine learning, which is kind of a nice follow-up for those that had a keynote talk previously. Uh, in our case, it was a knowledge transfer partnership. And for those who don't know, a knowledge transfer partnership is a funding opportunity for, provided by Innovate UK, where a partnership is set up between a company and university. In my case, it was you know, between Paxport and UE. And then they find you know, some soul, poor soul to be thrown in the middle, in this case me, to handle it. Uh, we'll be looking towards a travel industry is where the business was set up. Uh, essentially, Paxport likes to you know, advertise themselves as a content aggregator. Uh, instead of, you know, you'll be some holiday provider, instead of you going over and if you provide a focus on, let's say, low-cost travels, instead of you pro creating and maintaining your own service with you know, Ryanair, EasyJet, etc. You only use Paxport as a middleman, and they, you only then have to maintain only one interface. Paxport provides the rest from bookings to searches, both in flights and accommodation. That's their, their main goal. We mostly handled about three years of data. They did have more years, but the further you go, the, the worse it gets in quality. So let's say a reasonable time frame would be three years. And the initial goal was just say they wanted to improve the searches. You know, they wanted to have intelligent searches. You know, AI is a new thing, and so there was this claim of goal. Despite common challenges, you know, if you go through this area and just want to do any kind of data analysis and try to learn from data, the data quality itself and the transformations behind it will be the main challenge. But for this task at hand, tech, we will have these three main things, the scale, we're talking about millions of searches, the seasonality that's bound to the travel agency, uh, people having, you know, looking for holidays can change, <coughs> not just yearly, but sometimes just a tragedy can happen. So for instance, there can be terrorist attack in Egypt and suddenly people don't want to have flights or holidays there, so we have to be able to account for that. And given how the business model was set up, we have no actual user tracking because in this instance, we just deal with the back end and the front end are actually our clients and then the front end, the clients themselves are the ones that deal with the users. So with that in mind, I had to make a selection at the beginning. You know, what, kind of user, what kind of tools am I going to use to tackle this problem? My selection eventually came down to using you know, Python and Jupyter. One of the main reasons is not only the you know, being open source and the availability of many libraries that can help no, just, just like there's this actual common between Python and R, which one is the actual you know, a more active community. But also notebooks, I find that they are very powerful in terms of if you want ex you know, explorability in a high iteration value. Because, as I mentioned, we want intelligent searches is not really a very definite answer. No, what actually we want, like what we really want from it, intelligent search is really broad. So after some analysis and some exploration, we go and say, okay, let's do recommendations for accommodations. That, that seems like a, a more finite answer. In terms of you know, really you know, just key libraries you might want to look at, Pandas for data manipulation, it's really amazing. If you can have something in memory, just use Pandas. Scikit-learn will have most of the common you know, supervised and supervised clustering algorithms you can find. And then you can have you know, the background as NumPy and SciPy for arrays that, and uh, mathematic libraries. In terms of the approach, I want to focus on collaborative filtering. For those who don't know, collaborative filtering just simplifies the view of the data in a user item preference. The preference itself can be explicit or implicit. Uh, an explicit preference would be a rating you give, can just be a, a like or dislike, as you can see through the image, or it can be a rating between one or five stars to a hotel. So that's an explicit feedback. Implicit will be an action you take. And most common will be click-through data. Just the action of clicking on someone will, you know, will means that arguably people probably like it. A more one easy to remember will be listening to music. So Spotify really relies on using music listening counts to, you know, if you listen to a music 10, 20, 30 times, more than likely you like it better than the music you only, only listen once or twice. So the difference between the feedbacks will be explicit is a lot more powerful you know the meaning between one and five stars. You know that one will be a dislike, five will be 
alike, but it's a lot more scarce. You know, you have to actually ask the user to provide it, and that's not always the case. While implicit is a lot more abundant, but it's harder to manage. What's the difference between listening to music 100 times to 10? It's, it's hard to, you know, to put a definite value on that. And the prediction itself, the way it's made, is we find users that are similar in our preferences, and we use, well, let's say, a top K of the user similarities to make the prediction. So if, let's say if those three or four people have the similar preferences as me, we look at, did they like this music? Majority said yes, then probably I will also like it. Well, what are the advantages and the reason I selected initially this model? You only deal with one signal. That means all the data problems just can be thrown away. You only have to deal preference, user, and item. And currently, by the users of metric factorization, it's actually a very scalable approach. Disadvantages, well, you do need a, you know, a substantial amount of data to start having good predictions. And if you do read about collaborative filtering, the most common problem will be the cold start. Uh, and in its instance is, if you do not have a preference signal for a combination of user or item, you're not able to make any predictions on it. Now, a bit of text. So a bit of key aspects that happen on this problem. One, as I did mention, we had no user tracking. So one of the things we had to approach was instead, how do you represent our user? We use a super user approach. You can see it as a form of clustering. Uh, some of the reasoning behind it, you can just say, you know, if you have a party that only has adults, with a party that actually has adults and children, you can expect to have you know, different preferences between, between a family or some, maybe a couple on a romantic trip. Um, our signal is implicit, as I did mention before. We are dealing only with bookings, so the action of making a booking is an implicit signal. By using matrix factorization, the IALS, which stands for Implicit Alternating List Squares, is a really, uh, probably the only one approach that you can use with implicit feedback. You can follow the paper, and it's becoming really famous. Spotify uses it, YouTube uses it. Uh, even now Spark machine learning libraries has a, an application for it. And when it comes to the, the evaluation of you know, how, how is the performance of our model going, uh, there's two key aspects. One will be looking at the percentage top K of five results. This means when I ordered by the ranking, was the actual book in the top five results of my ranking or not? That will be our key metric. And we, to account for the seasonality of you know, the, how holidays and everything works out, we do it by a weekly, weekly window. We cannot randomize the data because it makes no sense. We do like, almost like a time series. You have to take that into consideration. So what were we working with? Close to a million bookings. Searches-wise, we, we do have quite a, a big sample to, you know, to, 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 be, to make sure that what we have is working. You know? Just above, uh, anything above 100,000, it's more than enough to, to get an inspiration. Uh, but do notice that we have an absurd sparsity amount. Reason behind this, you can, as you can imagine, there are many hotels spread throughout the whole world, and you know, you, you, you only have, like, will ever book for a fraction of it at every time. So even with the clustering of the super users, sparsity is still a major problem. And while I'm not explaining matrix factorization itself how it works, a key aspect of the model is it breaks down the, the feedback between observations and confidence. And observations will be, if you had a booking or not, you'll have a zero or one. So we'll have a, a booking happen between this user and this hotel, we have a one. And confidence will be how confident we are that, about that one. And the way the model works is by leveraging the, the amount of bookings, we have more confidence that yeah, probably this person likes it or not. And this was really helpful to find a way to adapt seasonality into it. So we could manage that confidence by saying a booking that happened a year ago doesn't have the same weight by a booking that happened a week ago. So by managing those weightings, we, we can embed this, in some sense, seasonality to the model. And the, obtaining the ranking is extremely light. Once you have the latent factors, you just multiply some small vectors, and then you have the ranking for what you want. So what does this mean? Well, although Python is great, there are many libraries. It so happens that this, I couldn't find a library with this implemented. So as people know, Python is known for being slow. And as you can see at the beginning, 
a simple, you know, just using normal Python implementation it takes 11 minutes to run. It might sound acceptable, 11 minutes, not much to wait, but when you consider I have to run it for over 100 iterations, suddenly we're looking about, what, two few hours. You know, this is impractical when you want to do a lot of testing. So thankfully, uh, there is a middle term in Python, which is Siphon. Of course, it's not as strong as actually using C, but it was more than enough to have a, to have a few orders of magnitude in terms of performance. B, do use libraries that allow you to have you know, appropriate representations. Space ma uh, sparse matrix representation is important instead of having, you know, for like an example of the memory footprint that you require if you didn't use it. As you can see, it's quite huge. And as I mentioned, when you rerun the model 100 times, not only you need it to do it fast, but the data has to be manipulated times and times over, because each time you have more entries of feedback. Therefore, pandas here was really key. Like It's really malleable, really easy to use, really fast. What we obtained, I just wanted to focus on those, you know, those two square boxes. Up, to, up you'll have the baseline. That's the performance we have to beat. And you can see across time, initially their performance was quite low, eventually because initially they only ranked by just the, the by price. The, the cheapest one will be ranked first. And eventually they started having human handcrafting. Humans would manually say this accommodation is rank one, rank two, rank three, so on and so forth. And down below you can see the one of the approaches I used does consistently beat the model. Uh, by the end of 2016, against human input, we're talking about between 5-6% you know, increase. And this is important to do an analysis like this, because you want to make sure that your model doesn't only work at a specific time, but will be valid, of course. In this case, across three years, the, the approach does hold. Another thing to be aware is you can just look at the, the bulk of the results. Um, in this case, you can make a separation by countries. The countries itself are anonymized. But as you can see, there's a big disparity by the number of searches. Some countries clearly have more holidays than others. And if you never made a separation like this, you could easily just say a country will have positive results while the other, all the others will have negative results. And you wouldn't be able to see it. Thankfully, the model does have learned a really successful global representation. A majority of the countries do get an improvement. Well, despite having, like, let's say, at worst, uh, one third doesn't get an improvement. And in terms of what this means for the company deploying it, no, just, just a simple multiplication. It can easily be scaled with just a simple proof of concept, a simple machine hosted in France. That's uh, the time it takes already, considering you know, the, the lag between making the request between UK and France. So, yeah, it's like, it, I. I as a takeaway, I would say I'm very surprised we actually were able to learn a global model. You know, considering the sparsity at best, as you, as you mentioned, for ever a thousand com combinations, you only have signal for two. So with that considered, we're actually able to learn something that's very positive. The necessity for adaptability, I will give it as a takeaway in terms of machine learning is evolving. Yes, there's a lot of hype, but there still is no one-to-one -one mapping. You do need to make some crafting, some adjustments to make it work. In our case, we didn't have users, so we needed to create a super user representation. And to really get pushes forward, we had to make that small adjustment to uh, embedded seasonality to the confidence value, which is not like, intended as the, the basis of the model. Notebooks are great for exploration, but don't be afraid. They won't overtake normal software development. They are just there and it was a, a quick and dirty tool. And you know, Pandas is awesome. Honestly, I, I just have good things that was to say about that library. So thank you all, and I think you're now open for questions.